Dr. Craig, we've just put out the new animated series on the resurrection of Jesus, and already there is an atheist response on YouTube. So it's already garnering some response. Good. Um, that's wonderful. What a coincidence. I did a video response to that series. I called it How Not to Defend Jesus' Resurrection with William Lane Craig. Nice to see them acknowledging YouTube criticisms. Maybe he'll discover mine one day. Now, the man who has responded goes by Paul Logia. Wait, what? Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. If you're new to the channel, take a second now to tap the subscribe button, because you're going to want to be notified about future videos in the back and forth between myself and Dr. William Lane Craig, because this is clearly just the start of something you won't want to miss. It was with utter shock and disbelief that I learned that William Lane Craig had addressed me directly in his Reasonable Faith podcast. The philosopher and apologist famously rejects all debates and formal public discussions with anyone who doesn't have a PhD in a related field, something I do not possess. In fact, the only non-PhD personality I've ever heard of Dr. Craig acknowledging is Scott Clifton back in 2011. Now, if you've already read the latter, uh, you may or may not have noticed the condescension dripping from nearly every paragraph. This thing is so swollen with bravado and ad hominem abuse. It actually takes a moment to find the arguments, uh, but I promise those are what I'm after. And while I think Craig's conduct here does his reputation enough of a disservice, I am more than prepared to tackle his poor reasoning and his apparent fifth grade level listening comprehension. Ouch. Well, let's see if Craig's argumentation with lay people has improved at all in the past eight years. Now, the man who has responded goes by Paul Logia. Apparently his name is Paul. I, I think he's from Canada. My name is Paul, and I am from Canada. Check. And he claims to be a former Christian who was even involved in youth ministry and went to Bible school. Canadian Bible College in Regina, Saskatchewan, to be precise. Though it has since relocated to Calgary and been renamed Ambrose College. I didn't just attend. I won academic awards and scholarships for being the best at everything they taught. Too bad they didn't teach better things. Who began to research the age of dinosaurs, how long ago they were on the earth, and that led to an unraveling of his faith. This is true. I was still a young Earth creationist while I was writing a graphic novel called Neozoic. Since this was a dinosaur project intended for a secular audience, I wanted to include some nods to mainstream science. As wrong as I thought they were. But even a cursory check into the evidence for an old Earth was intriguing enough to investigate further, which eventually led to abandoning young Earth beliefs, which in turn prompted a full-scale from-scratch investigation of the Bible and many, many nuanced steps along the way. But yes, dinosaurs were the first domino. He began to read atheist material. I eventually read atheist material, but not until after I'd exhausted Christian literature. I was attempting to affirm my faith, not destroy it. And then look at young earth creationism sites, and the, the atheist material made them look silly. A critical read of the creationism material, like the answers books from Ken Ham, were plenty silly on their own merit. I didn't even need to compare them to secular sources to see the problems. It was a harrowing experience to see the shallowness of my own position. This caused him to join the ranks, apparently, of the atheists and is now debating against Christianity. Mostly, he deals with Ken Ham, Answers in Genesis, Kent Hovind, Eric Hovind, and Young Earth. That's his main interest. My main personal interest is Bible textual criticism. But as I wanted my channel to kind of follow my personal education journey and to address the loved ones in my life who still believe, I started Apologia focused on young earth ideas. The video Craig is responding to today is an example of my shift towards general biblical topics. Speaking of that, isn't this supposed to be a response to my video response? Why are we deep diving into my biography here? What relevance could any of this have on whether Jesus rose from the dead? Apparently, as an adult Christian, he first became familiar with the fact that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago and that this was news to him. And that shocked me because, Kevin, as a, as a boy, I loved dinosaurs and obviously knew that they had lived millions and millions of years ago. And it's, it says something about this gentleman's education that he was never exposed to that fact until he was an adult Christian. He says he'd been a Christian for 30 years and never heard that dinosaurs lived millions of of years ago, so that when he learned that, this really shook him to the core in his faith. And I just can't imagine what sort of high school this fellow must have gone to to be innocent of that fact, at least to have heard of it. The science-supported age of dinosaurs was not news to me as an adult. 
I have no idea where you got that from. I also loved dinosaurs as a boy, which is one of the reasons I wrote two graphic novels about them. Obviously, as a kid, I'd heard and read the millions of years ago claims. And as a boy, I drove my poor Mennonite pastor crazy asking questions about where extinct creatures fit within the Bible. But I was trained to simply distrust and disbelieve any such old earth claims and accept that dinosaurs would have been on the ark and that somehow that explained everything. It wasn't news, but I'd spent my life putting in the category of fake news. I was taught to distrust facts that conflicted with my beliefs. And that is far more dangerous. Now he said, I was too busy yeah, to yeah. ever investigate any of this for myself. I just believed it. I believed that those who were over me in leadership, I guess pastors, teachers, I took their word for it. Apparently they had investigated it and I could trust them. But he said, I was just uh, too busy with family and, 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 and church ministry responsibilities. and church responsibilities to ever investigate it for myself. Yeah. This is accurate. And something I talk about for a reason, despite my shame because of it. I don't want anyone else to waste years of their life on unexamined beliefs. You know, that's one of the things that we want to prevent through reasonable faith yes. uh, and uh, encourage young people to investigate these things. And to the extent that you succeed, I'm excited. The more people who investigate, the more people who will come to the same conclusions I did. Yeah, in particular, before they go uh, to college or university. I agree that sooner is better, but why specify before they go to college? Do Christian ideas need parental supervision? Or when they run into internet infidel type material on, on the internet. I'm an internet infidel. That's a much better moniker than the disgruntled father one that Ken Ham gave me. I was stunned to think that he was so involved in church work and other responsibilities that he had no time for personal study. And that's an indictment of the church as well as, as of him. I think a lot of what the evangelical church does is busy work. The church is the community in-group social club that carries a side benefit of hell insurance. I think far more Christians are like the kind I was than the kind Craig wants. Most don't give it much thought and don't particularly want to. That the intellectual life of this person was just allowed, well, it was, it was stagnant. It was, he, he was, had a brain-dead Christian faith. Brain-dead? Wow. This is a full-on attempt to poison the well against what I haven't even said yet. If what I'm about to say is so obviously wrong, why all this preamble attempting to analyze me and frame my position? I'd love to take time to brag about the fruit of my devout Christian ministry, as the Apostle Paul does in 2 Corinthians 11, but instead I'll take his advice at the end of the passage. If I must boast, I will boast in the things that show my weakness. I'm nobody, Dr. Craig. I openly admit that I was duped by Christianity for most of my life, something I am now ridiculed for both by those of my faith family who used to affirm me, and I'm also mocked by those who knew it to be false all along. I would be better off to simply lick my wounds and hide for the rest of my life. But instead, I raise my voice on YouTube as a cautionary tale, an example of what happens to a human who doesn't question what they're being told, fed, taught. And yet, here you are, one of the most educated and celebrated Christian thinkers in the Western world, renowned for having grandiose ideas, talking about me. My person, my circumstances, not my ideas. We can play some clips from this. He does his own animation. <laughs> yes, and I thought it was very yeah. interesting, Kevin, that in the animation, he doesn't appear on screen himself. Rather, he does a voiceover for a rather millennial-looking young fellow who speaks for him, uh, when in fact we're dealing here with a man who is a middle-aged fellow, was a Christian 30 years. Are you kidding me right now? We're going to be talking about ages and appearances? I've been consistent since the beginning of my channel in discouraging indulging such superficialities and remaining entirely about the quality of the ideas. So we're talking about a Christian layperson that's uh, in his middle age uh, and not this young millennial type that is portrayed on the screen. Here's a recent picture of me. Lest this somehow be relevant. I guess I'm Gen X? Maybe it's because I'm much closer in age to being a millennial than Craig is, but I just don't see how my scribbling looks to be a millennial. A millennial fan of the show, Cheshire Vic, sent me her version of what a millennial apology might look like. Maybe I should go with that from now on, so I can be hit with the kids. Is that how this works? This is an effective way of, of reaching out to the younger generation. What blows my mind about this whole discussion is that we're talking about a series of videos from Craig's ministry that are not only fully animated, not only don't include any imagery of Craig at all, but each is narrated by a different actor with a pleasant non-American speaking accent. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Whatever begins to exist 
as a cause. It's logically possible that a maximally great pizza exists. None of these videos of Craig's include his face or his voice, just his script. Should this make us suspicious of the information? I've never mentioned any of this before because only the ideas matter. Why is Craig bringing any of this up? This is the second person that I've run into just looking at things online who didn't discover Christian philosophy and apologetics until after they deconverted. Yes. Uh, and, it says, uh, and for the most part. And now find themselves in this new commitment, in this new worldview, joining the ranks of those who are critiquing and opposing Christianity, and now are looking at all the material. Yes. Yeah. I was still a believer when I started looking much more seriously at apologetics material like Craig's. But yes, I've continued to absorb and explore more voraciously after my deconversion than I did before. I don't want to be wrong, so it makes sense to continuously test and check and reevaluate. I'm not dogmatic about my disbelief. I'm open to all evidence and arguments and will become a Christian again tomorrow if I were to be convinced it was true. When it comes to Christian philosophy, that would have been a complete waste of time for me as a believer because I felt my indoctrination and personal experiences made the existence of God very obvious to me. I had no need of cleverly worded syllogisms to affirm that, and when I eventually doubted, the syllogisms did nothing to encourage me. Sorry. And yet, now here I am, having a chat about philosophy and apologetics with a world-class philosopher. Presumably that will be the topic, eventually once he stops degrading me. And we'll take a look at what he has to say. Okay. This video is too long for the podcast, so let's just deal with his critique of the empty tomb. All right. What I'm doing now is a response to a response to a response to a source video. So it can get a little tricky in terms of setting the context of the discussion. I hope you'll forgive me for summarizing the history in a few places for the sake of time. All the videos that got us here will be linked in the description, so you can double check my editing for honesty. Take the time to watch them, because the part one in the title of Craig's podcast tells me that this is going to be a series. The original video asserts that there are three facts surrounding the resurrection of Jesus that need to be explained. The first of which, it claims, is an empty tomb. And then put up this graphic stating that The discovery that Jesus' tomb was empty is reported in no less than six independent sources. I started with the Corinthians passage correctly noting that the word tomb doesn't appear at all, which seems pretty important in a proof text for a tomb. It says Jesus was buried, but that phrasing can apply equally to burial in a marked grave, an unmarked grave, or even a mass grave, the kind that nearly all Roman crucifixion victims are thrown into. The critique here shows that he is unfamiliar with my published work, which undergirds the video and which this video presents in a summary fashion. This is a curious claim, as later in the same video, I will be referencing Craig's published work. I'm familiar with it, I'm just not convinced by it. When I critique Craig's videos, it's common for Christians who object that the animations are merely summaries that require exhaustive study of Craig's written work in order to discuss. But at no point do his videos indicate that there's a greater nuance to be found or suggest where to find it. No, these videos depict the topics as quick, finite, black and white, beyond dispute, sappy answers to unworthy questions, and are designed so that a Christian will walk away feeling warm and fuzzy that an authority like Craig has investigated these complicated matters and found them to be overwhelmingly in favor of Jesus. So they should stop thinking about it and move on to whatever cat video that YouTube is recommending next. You know, the kind of take it on authority that Craig scolded me for a few minutes ago. He hides behind this, it's just the summary excuse, when his words are clearly carefully selected to avoid lying, but at the same time obfuscate actual facts. But I'm sure we'll get to some of that before the series ends. The point here is that Paul is quoting from an extremely early tradition that goes back to within the first five years after Jesus' death. I'm not questioning the timing, at least today. I'm questioning the content. The passage doesn't mention the tomb that you say it's an attestation to. And the two lines of the formula, that he was buried and he was raised, could only have been understood by a first century Jew to imply that the physical body that was in the grave was no longer there. I'm not attempting to argue non-physical resurrection, rather the nature of this grave that was no longer there. You say it was a tomb, but the passage does not. Now, the question arises then, is this the same event that is described in the Gospels as the discovery of the empty tomb. If it's up for debate whether this is even the same story, it's kind of tough to call it an attestation for said story. And what you discover is that what Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 15 in this formula is a summary, point for point, 
of the gospel narratives on the one hand and the apostolic preaching on the other. Even if everything Craig says here is correct, a summary cannot be an independent attestation of details not included in the summary. That Christ died, that he was buried. But not where or how he was buried. What corresponds to the second line is the burial by Joseph of Arimathea in the tomb. In Return of the Jedi, C-3PO takes some time to summarize for the Ewoks the events of the trilogy thus far, including a mention of an exploding Death Star, Han being frozen in carbonite, and escaping Java. These correspond with events of the film, certainly, but 3 po summary couldn't be used as an attestation to a Wampa attacking Luke, Yoda's death, or even begin to answer the question of whether Han or Greedo shot first. Those events aren't mentioned. Just as 1 Corinthians 15 doesn't mention Joseph of Arimathea, neither we nor the Ewoks are justified in filling in details that the source doesn't provide. Infer all you want, but we cannot know what the creators of this creed believed about an empty tomb, the thing you are making strong assertions about. So that I think it is uh, highly probable that what we have here is a summary and outline form of the principal events of Jesus' passion, his death, his burial by Joseph in the tomb, the discovery of his empty tomb, and then his post-mortem appearances. I think it is highly probable that 1 Corinthians 15 is an outline form summary about Jesus is a mile away from your claim in your video that 1 Corinthians actually records an empty tomb. When an event is recorded by two or more unconnected sources, it does not. Continuing the video. I went on to the Acts passage Craig holds up, which talks about King David's full tomb, but similarly makes absolutely no reference at all to Jesus' tomb, full or empty. I think it's very clear that there is a contrast drawn by Peter between the tomb of David and the tomb of Jesus. He says, David died, he was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. But this Jesus, God raised up. And I think that that is an indication of the empty tomb. And as I say, any first century Jew would have understood that to mean that that tomb would have been empty. I'm sorry, Dr. Craig. Again, your original video listed this passage specifically as one that records the fact of an empty tomb. It specifically does not record this. If your original video had said, I personally think this passage is an unexpressed literary indication of an empty tomb belief, as you do now, I'd have had no complaint. The truth is, you are overstating your position in these summaries, and when I happen to know enough to call out your imprecise language, you cover that up by questioning my intellect. Now, is this an independent source from the traditions in the Gospel of Luke? Yes, and the argument here is not that the book of Acts is independent from the Gospel of Luke, but rather that in writing the book of Acts, Luke drew upon the traditions of the early apostolic preaching. The idea that the same author used one set of apostolic traditions for his first book, and for some reason used an entirely different and independent set of apostolic traditions for his second book, seems unrealistic, unwarranted, and a bit of a stretch. As this is a bit of a tangent related to the empty tomb, please see my Are the Gospels Independent Sources video for more. And so what we have here is a pre-Lucan source, namely the early apostolic preaching upon which Luke drew in writing the book of Acts. Christians should note here that Craig does not go so far as to claim that the author of Acts was himself an eyewitness to any of these events. That is not backed by evidence, nor would it play to his point. There are gems of intellectual honesty that I like in Craig's work that probably would have upset the Christian that I was. And this apostolic preaching is arguably extremely early. Arguably early, which also means arguably late. Believing New Testament scholars disagree heavily on this. But again, my complaint against using this Luke passage as written affirmation of an empty tomb is not the time of the writing, but rather that the passage doesn't actually mention an empty tomb. That seems important. And that's important because it mitigates against the notion that these are later legends that built up over the decades and eventually got written down in the New Testament. It does not, however, mitigate against these traditions being early legends that spread and grew in the first months and years. Stories of Elvis sightings were circulating widely mere days after his death on August 16th, 1977, and the stories continue to this day despite all manner of verification available. I wonder if Craig has read any of the many peer-reviewed studies on legend propagation, or what his thoughts are on the findings that the macabre, the gruesome, or supernatural elements accelerate the process. How exactly has Craig decided what is too soon for legend and what is not? When you have two independent accounts, 
that tell the same event, that increases the probability that this is actually historical rather than just independently made up. Luke and Acts were written by the same author. Make whatever kind of arguments you want. That is certainly not the pinnacle sign of document independence that historians are looking for. Different authors would be high up on that independent source wish list. Okay, continuing. These can no more be considered independent sources than a Harry Potter book, Harry Potter movie, and Harry Potter video game could be considered independent sources for the existence of Hogwarts School of Magic. The movie and the video game are obviously adaptations of the original book, so are useless to corroborate it. Now here we see again his misunderstanding of New Testament scholarship, as well as his unfamiliarity with the published material that the video summarizes. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are not independent of one another. This is an excellent admission that may not be welcome to some Christians. Thank you for that. But there are sources upon which these evangelists drew in writing their Gospels that are independent of one another. Just to give one example, in addition to Mark's Gospel, Luke and Matthew seem to share an independent source that scholars refer to as Q, uh, and this seems to have been a sayings source of Jesus' teachings. It wasn't a record of historical events like the Gospels, but rather it was a record of Jesus' teachings or sayings, and this seems to have been employed by Matthew and Luke um, to supplement. Uh, what they learned from Mark. The hypothetical Q source. By Craig's admission, it is only a record of Jesus' quotes and sayings and not a narrative. Remember here that I'm talking about the source independence precisely and only in the context of an empty tomb. As none of the sayings of Jesus are remotely related to the empty tomb, the non-empty tomb portions of the book may have used independent source Q is entirely irrelevant to today's discussion. Despite the places where authors of Matthew and Luke changed and expanded upon Mark's version of the empty tomb narrative, all iterations of this story are clearly adapted from a single, generally unified tradition, which Craig will affirm. And then Mark himself draws upon a pre-Markan passion story for his account of the final week of Jesus' death. All you have said here is that the author of Mark was a middleman who didn't witness the events himself. So that when the authors of Luke and Matthew copied Mark verbatim, they were really copying the source Mark used rather than Mark himself. This doesn't add any independence. And this pre-Mark and Passion story is one of the earliest sources uh, behind the New Testament, comparable to the tradition that Paul hands on in 1 Corinthians 15. We're not talking about dating here. We're talking about independence. Putting the church's passion narrative tradition even earlier, and as entrenched as the 1 Corinthians 15 creed is said to be, means it's even less likely that the other empty tomb sources could be considered independent or uninfluenced by it. So our critic here is simply unfamiliar with the way New Testament criticism operates. I've become very familiar with how it works. A seemingly endless series of post hoc rationalizations to uphold a position held for other reasons. Though I greatly appreciate that Craig acknowledges the realities of the text. They are not from eyewitnesses, they are not inerrant, they contain passages that are likely not literal events, and they are derived from second-hand sources. All these things Craig affirms with me. We just differ on conclusions to be drawn. We do indeed have independent sources in L, M, and the pre-Mark and Passion story for the empty tomb of Jesus. Pre-Mark is indistinguishable from Mark. When it comes to the empty tomb narrative specifically, L gives every appearance to be merely the theological embellishments to Mark made by the author of Luke, and M the embellishments to Mark made by Matthew. Both Craig and I go deeper into this in my recent Are the Four Gospels Independent Sources video, linked in the description. And Bill, all that about Harry Potter, that's a meme. That gets passed around a lot. I wasn't sure I'd ever come across someone who disliked memes as much as I do, but as we'll see, I think Craig is in the running. That's thrown against the Christian faith saying that uh, the Bible's no more evidence for Jesus than the Harry Potter series and video games are evidence for the School of Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. you know? And that, that's question begging because he's chosen deliberately an example which everybody knows to be fiction. So it's and that's begging genre. the question yeah, it's, against the Gospels. Yeah. Begging the question is when the conclusion is assumed in one of the premises. If you've seen my videos on Craig's ontological argument, you'll know that he's very familiar with this tactic and uses it liberally in his work. His hand-waving and obfuscation about fiction versus history allowed him to either miss or deliberately avoid the actual point of my comparison. Literary dependence, not truth. Perhaps I should have chosen the movie Apollo 13, which was based on the 1994 book Lost Moon, which was, in turn, based on various historical sources about the Apollo 13 mission. 
we don't get to say that the 1995 movie counts as a brand new additional independent corroborative source as to what transpired in space in 1970. We understand that elements in the movie, not found in the book or historical documents, might have come purely from the storytelling goals of director Ron Howard. But would the Apollo 13 example also have been begging the question of the historical accuracy of the Bible? Because I'd have chosen an example everyone knows to be historical. Not at all. We're talking about source dependence here. And he needs to deal with the fact that in the Gospels we do have these independent historical sources attesting to certain facts, which have led most scholars to think that these are indeed historical. All right, here's the first appeal to most scholars, a term that I find apologists to be somewhat loose with. Are we talking about most Christian theology scholars? New Testament scholars? Secular history scholars? What group exactly? Where can I find this list of which scholars think what? Historians don't declare the Gospels as a block to be historical or not. They examine the evidence piece by piece, claim by claim. The certain facts that Craig just spoke of. Specifically, this whole video is supposed to be about the single claim of an empty tomb. I've put out this challenge before and I'll ask it again of Dr. Craig. Please let me know of a single, non-Christian scholar who will affirm that this specific empty tomb claim is historical. Just one. I'm waiting. Let's continue with the video. Next in my video, I granted a concession that for the sake of this discussion, I'd consider the Gospel of John to indeed be independent of the Synoptic Gospels, though that I'm doing so under a slight protest, because noted Christian scholars do see evidence of literary dependence between John and Mark. I'm not aware of any compelling case that John knew Mark. Might I suggest the recent Proving Jesus Authority in Mark and John overlooked evidence of a synoptic relationship by Gary Greenberg, president of the Biblical Archaeology Society of New York and a fellow of the Jesus Project, or the essay John for Readers of Mark by British scholar Richard Bauckham, senior New Testament history and theology scholar at Ridley Hall, Cambridge, in the book The Gospel for All Christians, which argues that the Gospel of Mark served as a template for the author of John. There are others as well, not sure if Craig is unaware of them, or merely finds them not compelling. Now, thats it's certainly conceivable. That's all I'm saying. There's a lot of material in John about the resurrection of Jesus that isn't drawn from Mark, and uh, so one would need to consider that as well. John certainly strays from Mark, but if Mark may have influenced John, as Craig concedes, or if they were both influenced by the same oral traditions, that certainly weakens the confident assertion that they are independent. What we have here is the first of many details to be accepted entirely on the basis of, for the Bible tells me so. Let's stop there. That's an assertion that shows a complete misunderstanding of what historical scholarship is about. I completely misunderstand. When historical scholars investigate Jesus of Nazareth, they are not treating the Bible as some inspired, inerrant document. That's good. Did you hear that, Christians? They are treating these documents that were later collected into the New Testament as they would treat any other sources for ancient history. I agree that some historians do this, though far too many do not. I'm glad this is a position you endorse. And they're asking the question of Jesus of Nazareth, the very same question they would ask of Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great. Did Caesar really cross the Rubicon to attack Rome? Did Alexander actually carry out this and that campaign? They would also ask if Julius Caesar was really a descendant of the goddess Venus or the war god Mars, or if Julius Caesar himself was a god. There is historical evidence for all of these claims. Similarly, we have historical evidence that the Alexander the Great who crossed the Rubicon also claimed to be the descendant of Achilles and Zeus. Do historians not evaluate these claims as well? Some claims rise to the level of historically probable, others do not. Wasn't it you who was arguing that each must be evaluated separately? And the fact that this gentleman apparently thinks that's the way New Testament scholarship operates is evidence, Kevin, of his complete lack of understanding yeah. of, of how New Testament historians uh, approach their subject. I'm afraid it's you, Dr. Craig, who lacks an understanding of the difference between biblical and extra-biblical sources. I say, for the Bible tells me so, when a claim comes entirely from the pages of the Bible and cannot be corroborated with any contemporary extant sources outside of the Bible. Quite literally, for the Bible tells me so. When it comes to the so-called empty tomb, this is not in dispute by any scholar I've ever heard of. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but nowhere in your videos or scholarly books provide an example of documentation for the empty tomb outside of the pages of the Bible. Again, quite literally, for the Bible tells me so. I don't see how I'm the one who fails to understand here. 
I think you're just prejudiced against my argument being set to the music of a haunted ice cream truck. Well, throughout this video, you're going to hear that little musical passage, For the Bible Tells Me So, For the Bible Tells Me yeah. So. Very, Very unfortunate. Open. See? He doesn't like the tune. It's not like I wrote it. I learned it in Sunday school. All right, Bill, let's pick it up right there next time. Ooh, there's going to be a next time. Be sure to subscribe today so you don't miss my next response to Craig's next response to my response to Craig's video on the resurrection of Jesus. You don't want to miss it. Until next time. Later.